Welcome as we continue our journey through the Word of God, and today we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 to 9, where Paul continues to address the issues that the church in Corinth had with each other, and he is now about to answer some questions about sexual relations in regards to marriage. Now, this was obviously an issue in the church in Corinth, as were all these things that Paul talks about, 1 Corinthians, but they give us as Christians today guidelines of what meant to, when meant to do in these areas of our lives. So that's why we take them. It's not a historical reflections. They are, they are telling us about what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and how they still apply to us today. So we start off in verse one. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual, sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. So Paul talks here about specific things that were asked of him in a letter by the church in Corinth. Now, he starts off here and he says, it is, not, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. The word touch here, the Greek word that's used here, is used in the sense of having sexual relationships with her. Now, this again was probably a statement that was made by the church in Corinth when they wrote this letter to him. We don't have a copy of that letter. And they asked Paul to agree with it. They probably asked him a question. Now, you agree with this, don't you? Paul's going to agree with the statement, but he has a reservation, which is the nevertheless of verse 2. Nevertheless. Uh, why would the church in Corinth suggests complete celibacy? This is a question, which is what they meant by, uh, it's, you know, a man should not touch a woman. They probably, we don't know, they probably thought that if sexual immorality was such a danger, then the way to be the most pure would be just to abstain from sex altogether, even in marriage. And Paul says, no, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. In light of the danger of sexual immorality, which was present then and it is today, it's appropriate for a husband and wife to have each other in a sexual way. Paul's not commanding the church in Corinth that they have to get married. He's actually going to deal with that issue later on in, in Corinthians, in the, in the first Corinthians. But it's a command to live as a married person in the sexual sense. Paul means that husbands and wives should continue in their sexual relationship. Don't just have sex when you get married for children and then stop having sex. Paul is also saying that sex is not the only reason for marriage, or nor is it the most important reason for marriage. He's simply answering their very specific question about sex in marriage. Uh, he's not giving a complete breakdown of what marriage means. If you want to know what that looks like, you would go to his letter to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 to 33, and also the uh, expose that he wrote to the church in Colossae in Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. So, then we move on to verse 3. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. Uh, instead of a man not touching a woman, Paul says, no, 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 within marriage, you must give your wife the affection that is due to her. It's wrong for a husband to withhold affection from his wife. This is a very important phrase because Paul meant this to apply to every Christian marriage. And it shows that every wife has affection that is due to her. Paul's not thinking about only the young wives who are getting married and ready to bear children. 
or that only submissive wives are due affection. No, every wife is due affection, even in a tough marriage. Why? Because she's the wife of a Christian man. Paul also emphasizes what this woman actually needs. And it's not just merely sexual relationship. It is the affection due to her. If a husband has sexual relationships with his wife, but without true affection due to her, then he's not giving her what she needs or is due. Now, I think also, uh, Guzik points this out, affection also reminds us that when a couple is unable for physical or other reasons to have a complete sexual relationship, they can still have an affectionate relationship and thus fulfill God's pur purpose for these commands. Now, in the same idea, same vein, the wife to her husband. Let's talk about that. The wife is not permitted to withhold marital affection from her husband. Paul puts this idea very strongly. There is a mutual sexual responsibility in a marriage. The husband has obligations to his wife and the wife has obligations towards the husband. So he uses this word render, we get the English word render, to his wife. The emphasis is here, the emphasis is on giving. And it's, it's on the position of I owe you this, not you owe me this. And if each person in a marriage says, oh, I owe you my body, oh, I owe you my body too. From God's perspective, sex is, is a much, uh, it's on a much higher level than just privilege or duty. The, the wife does not have authority over her own, hus her own body. We're going to, we're, let's talk about that. These obligations are so incredibly strong and definite that you can say that the, the woman's body does not belong to her and the man's body does not belong to him. And that doesn't justify any man abusing his wife or coercing his wife sexually. Paul's point is that we have an obligation through a covenant relationship to serve our partner with physical affection. God has chosen somebody for you and you for somebody else to meet their sexual needs. Nobody else, just one person. So he says, so don't deprive each other because I've got nobody else that can solve the problem or fulfill the need. Paul rejects the, the idea of the church in Corinth that a husband and wife could be more holy if they stopped having sex. In fact, he says, no, no, no. Harm can come your way if you start depriving one another because you'll open the door to the tempter so that Satan does not tempt you, Paul says. Now, the word for deprive here is the same word as used, uh, that's used for defraud in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 8. When we deny physical affection and sexual intimacy to our spouse, we cheat them, we defraud them. So he says, do not deprive. Sexual deprivation in marriage is not just about frequency and how often you have sex, it's also about the romance involved in it as well. It's why Paul says to hus husbands, render to your wife the affection due her. Deprivation in either sense gives an occasion for the deprived person to look somewhere else for their fulfillment, which then destroys the marriage. They shouldn't do that. They're not given permission by God to do that. But, but Paul's saying that's what the tempter will tempt them with if both of you don't do what God wants you and needs you and expects you to do in your covenant relationship. And then he says, for your lack of self-control. And it could be easy to think that self-control is expressed by abstaining from sexual relationships in marriage. But Paul says that to deprive one another is to show a lack of self-control. It's a lack of self-control that will leave the other one easily tempted by Satan. It's the reverse of what you think. And then he says, I say this as a concession. God will permit, as a concession, a married couple to abstain from sexual relationships for a short time for the sake of fasting and prayer only. But only if this concession is for a time. And then the husband and wife have to come together again in a sexual sense. But he also says, not as a commandment. God doesn't command 
or recommend abstaining from sex within a marriage. It can be done for a brief time for a specific spiritual reason. The reason that this principle in this passage is so important is because it's where God makes it clear that there's nothing wrong but everything right with sex in a marriage. I, I think it's amazing as a pastor that the devil's strategy is so simple when it comes to sex. What he does is he does everything he can to encourage sex outside the boundaries that God sets. Man and a woman inside marriage. So he says, no, no, ha no, he tries to entice you to have sex in every other possible way apart from that. But then when you get married, man and a woman inside, in inside marriage, the devil does everything to discourage sex. See, before Christian couples get married, they can't keep their hands off each other, and then they get married and they don't want to touch each other. It's a victory for Satan when he, he gets you to have sex outside marriage, and it's a victory for Satan when he gets you to stop having sex inside a marriage. That's not, Jesus is not winning in either one of those. And that's um, the way that some of the church in Corinth thought that it was fine to maybe hire the service as a prostitute. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 to 20. Uh, other Corinthian Christians thought it was more spiritual for husband and wife to never have sexual relationships. But a Christian husband and wife should never accept a poor sexual relationship. This is what Paul's saying. The problems may not necessarily be so easy to overcome. They may not be quickly solved. But God wants every Christian marriage to enjoy a sexual relationship that is a genuine blessing. It's not a burden and it's not a curse. So let's move on to verse 7. For I wish that all men were even as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Very well-known Bible verse. I wish that all men were even as I am myself. Paul, when he was writing this, was unmarried. So he's putting himself among the unmarried and the widows. And at this time, now, here he recognizes the benefit of being single, which he's going to speak more about later on. Now, Let's talk about the conjecture of whether Paul was ever married or not, because he speaks here very clearly as a single person. But there, there is some conjecture about whether he was married or not. So I want to take you through that and allow you just to ponder it. Uh, so I'm going to quote from Guzik on this. Though Paul was unmarried when he wrote the letter, he probably and may have been married at one time. We can say this because we know that Paul was an extremely observant Jew, and among his people, he was an example. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. In Paul's days, uh, in the days that Paul lived, Jews considered marriage a duty to the extent that a man reaching 20 years of age without marrying was considered to be in sin. Unmarried men were often considered excluded from heaven and not real men at all. Also, by Paul's own words, it is likely that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. In Acts 26, verse 10, Paul says, I cast my vote against them, speaking of the early Christians. And the logical place that he would cast a vote is as a member of that great congress of the Jewish people. An unmarried man could not be a member of the Sanhedrin, so Paul was probably married at one time. So what happened to Paul's wife? The scriptures are silent. Perhaps she left him when he became a Christian, or perhaps she died sometime before or after he became a Christian. But we know that it was likely he was married before, and we know that he was not married when he was writing this letter, and the book of Acts never shows Paul's wife. Paul was probably well qualified to speak of the relative gifts and responsibilities of both marriage and singleness, because he knew both from his life experience. That is just extrapolation, conjecture, and you can make of that whatever you will. It's a little bit of history to add flavor to the scriptures. Each one has his own gift from God. Though Paul knew singleness was good for him, he wasn't going to impose it on anyone because the important thing is what gift you have from God. 
either being gifted to be single or gifted to be married. And significantly, Paul regards both marriage and singleness as gifts from God. And many people find themselves looking at the grass being greener on the other side. Single people wish they were married. Married people wish they were single. And each state is a gift from God. It's a gifting from God. When Paul writes his own gift, and he uses those words, he uses the same word for spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Each state, married or single, needs a spiritual spiritual gifting from God to work. And Paul's understanding that the unmarried state can be a gift is uh, especially striking when we consider the Jewish background of Paul himself and the early church. It was regarded as a sin, as I mentioned, for a Jewish man to be unmarried. Uh, Trapp says this, Among the Jews, marriage was not held a thing indifferent or at their own liberty to choose or refuse, but it was a binding command. Adam Clark quotes from an ancient Jewish writing known as the Gemara, and it says this, It is forbidden a man to be without a wife, because it is written, it is not good for man to be alone. And whosoever gives not himself to generation and multiplying is all one with a murderer. He is as though he diminished from the image of God. So these are strong things that were written about marriage to Jewish men like Paul at the time. And Paul recognizes that some are gifted for marriage. And some are gifted for an unmarried state. So he's now talking about something different than what the Jews had been taught. No one is gifted, however, for sexual immorality. The married must live faithfully to their spouse and the unmarried must live a celibate lifestyle. So he says, if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. But it's not like the old days when you had to marry. It's not like those times. Paul's recommendation to marry is not based on marriage being more or less spiritual, but on very practical concerns. And relevant to his day, which he talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verses 26, 29, 32, which we're going to get on and read, a godly sexual relationship within the covenant marriage is God's plan for meeting our sexual needs. That's how God designed it. And Paul preferred the unmarried state at this stage of his life for himself. He doesn't want anyone else to think that being married was less spiritual or more spiritual. It's all according to an individual's spiritual gift. Remember, Paul told Timothy that forbidding to marry was a doctrine of demons, 1 Timothy chapter 4. So don't do that. It's better to marry than to burn with passion. Paul recognizes that marriage as a legitimate refuge from the pressures of sexual immorality It's where one should not feel that they are immature or they're not spiritual because they desire to get married one day so that they won't any longer burn with passion. At the same time, let me be very, very clear about this. If you have a problem with lust or sexual sin, do not think that getting married is going to solve your problems. There have been many Christian men in particular who have been very disappointed to find that their lust for other women didn't suddenly magically go away when they got married. You've got to deal with that before marriage. So uh, let's leave it there for today. And uh, what do you observe out of this? Uh, I observed that Paul was very specific from the heart of God about giving us guidelines for this area of our lives. And I think there are some very challenging scriptures and points that are made in this scripture that a lot of Christians need to really look at. I know as a pastor, I would say, if I was guessing, half, and I think it's probably more, half of Christian marriages do not have a healthy sex life because one or the other feels that if they don't want to, they can say no. Now, I actually think it's probably a lot higher, but I'm going to be generous and say half and half. But if that's you and you're in a Christian marriage and you don't have a healthy sex life, you need to read this scripture and work out and understand what it is you need to do to make it right. You don't own your body. Your husband doesn't own his. Husbands, you don't own your body. Your wife doesn't own hers. You are meant to, husbands, you are meant to, maybe maybe why you're not having a fulfilled sex life with your wife is because you're showing her no affection due her at all. There's no affection. Start showing your wife some affection. Wives, same thing. 
Your husband needs affection. You might think he only needs sex, but he also needs affection. He needs words of encouragement. He needs a lot of things. But if we would both come at it from a perspective of understanding that we're, we don't own each other's and what we are meant to do is give each other what we need and what they need, then it takes away the opportunity for the devil to come in and do something that he wants to do, which is always the opposite of what God wants to do. So there you go. What do you observe out of it? Tell me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful passage of scripture. It just shines a light on so many things that that we can find ourselves in difficult positions navigating. Help us, God, as we understand your word in this area, to understand the context of what it is you're trying to teach us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.